Welcome to the South and Sideways podcast on the Urban Sentinel channel. I am your host, the Urban Sentinel. This podcast episode is episode 03, Fallout, Into That Wild Wasteland. So let's get into it. Coming up April 11th, Amazon, on its Amazon Prime video, is displaying a new TV series. I believe it's going to be eight episodes. It's called Fallout. It's based upon a long-running series of video games dating back to the very late 90s. I personally am a fan of the game. I've played the series. I've enjoyed every single iteration that has come out, and I am excited and looking forward to what this TV show has to offer on multiple aspects. First and foremost, from an emergency preparedness point of view, there is always something to be gained from works of fiction. Because works of fiction, that creative thought process, sometimes it opens up your mind to different possibilities, different angles and approaches to problems, to situations that you yourself may not be exposed to, may hopefully never be exposed to, but better to plant the seed, the idea, and let that grow, that if something like that should happen, you have some semblance of an idea, of a plan, of a course of action to take in those situations. Now, with that being said, I want to declare right off the top, it is works of fiction. It is purely for entertainment, and it shouldn't be viewed as some hardcore, you know, stick in the rules type of situation. It is just meant to be a fun, entertaining show. Should have a little bit of drama, a little bit of mystery, definitely a lot of humor. Some of it dark, but nonetheless, still humor is a key factor in it. It should have you wondering what's next or how could this possibly get any stranger. But across the board, it shouldn't be anything offensive to make you clutch the pearls and, you know, be aghast at whatever it is that you see. Again, purely for entertainment, it is pure fun, just like the games. Now, I'm going to give you a brief rundown on the game so you have an idea of what the show potentially could be like. In the series of the Fallout world, Effectively, you are a post-apocalyptic survivor. Your character, which in the game you create your character, you make your your persona, you have survived after nuclear war. Long has faded into the background. The world is a wasteland of dust and debris and strange creatures moving about and some survivors here and there. The vault that you were in was a vault built by a company called Vault-Tec, which private business, think about the Elon Musk Boring Company or any large uh, construction company that perhaps does that type of work. They were built not for everyone in the country, not for every single man, woman, and child, but for those lucky lottery few, almost like winning a timeshare down in Florida. If you're selected, you fill out the application, you put down your deposit, and you are good to go. So in the event that the war does happen, you just have to get to the closest shelter. And it's not saying that every shelter was at the end of the block, in your neighborhood, or even in your town. It was just simply a matter of they were spread out across the country and selected people in those areas. Now, with that being said, these vaults were underground, deep underground. They contained everything a small community would need to survive, effectively waiting out the thermal nuclear warfare that went on above. They had medical facilities. They had research facilities. They had uh, engineering and machining and repair shops. They had administrative personnel to basically keep things running and moving along smoothly. The head of that would be called the overseer. They had security personnel to keep people protected. And yes, you, you raise the question of, well, if you're inside in the vault, who do you need protection from? But we'll get to that later. They have dormitories and rooms and restaurants and recreational facilities, everything that that small, growing community would need to come back to humanity after the war was over. Now, with that being said, again, I mentioned that they were vaults spread out across the country. Not every vault was created equally. Not every vault held the exact same number of people or had the exact amount of supplies needed for those inhabitants to make it through. Some of those vaults, unfortunately, were deliberately, shall we say, altered to get different results during that time of crisis. And I won't go too far into the detail, but if you think about private corporations and you think about government sponsorship, I'm sure you can visualize what could possibly go wrong or what type of hijinks could happen in those situations. Needless to say, your character 
at some point has to leave the vault, whether they're fleeing the vault for their own safety, whether they've been sent out of the vault on a mission to find someone or to get something back, whatever the case may be, you venture out into that wasteland, a place that you have only heard about. You only understand what the world was like before the bombs. You've never witnessed it. You don't have anything else to go on other than the information that is given to you. Now, there are small little details here and there, which if some of you are fans of the game, you know that I'm skipping over primarily to avoid potential spoilers. There is an element of surprise. There's always going to be a question, especially if I'm looking at the trailer that I've seen for the show, it will leave people who are not familiar with the game with a lot of questions, but it also seems to have several questions that I myself as a fan, you know, I've raised my hand up and think, you know, what is that that I'm looking at? Now, moving forward, your character ventures out of the vault to go on this mission, whatever it is, the world is open to you. You can go ahead and follow the necessary clues that you have. You can plot your course into the unknown, but you are effectively out on your own with only the skills and knowledge that you have. You must scavenge where you find things. You must figure out how to survive. You encounter people, you encounter creatures. You have to make decisions on how you will interact and your interactions and behavior affect, in many cases, the response or the attitude that you get. Not unlike real life, you may have the intention on doing no harm, but your language or your posture or your mere presence may cause others to think something different. You navigate through this world, uncovering clues, finding information, meeting people, both hostile and friendly, eventually earning and learning and gaining more skills and more competency in the wasteland to survive. Now, on a quick note, if you're just simply in the game to get the mission done, to figure out what it is, yes, you can move along, you can huff it, you know, all the way through and make that game as fast as possible. But if you're like me, if you're curious, if you want to know more, if you want to see what's around you, you're going to be exploring. You're going to be coming across places that you couldn't even fathom in your own imagination. And playing in the game, that is the world that it begins to incorporate. You begin to see all of the things that, yes, you as the player recognize because you might be in areas from Bangor, Maine, Bar Harbor, Boston, Massachusetts, Washington, D.C., Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You could be down in Las Vegas, Nevada, or in Los Angeles, California, or up in San Francisco. You could be places that you know exist within our world, but they are slightly altered because, again, work of fiction, alternate timeline, that sort of thing. But there are icons, there are landmarks that still hold that familiarity. It's almost like the scene from the original Planet of the Apes when Charlton Heston's character was moving along the beach and he was by the shore and he came across the Statue of Liberty buried almost entirely up to her chin with only a portion of her arm sticking out. And he realized at that point that he wasn't on some strange planet where the Apes were the dominant species. He was on Earth, and something had happened on Earth so catastrophic that it sent mankind back to the Stone Age, but yet somehow managed to allow the primates, the apes there, to elevate themselves to the species in charge. It's that sort of plot twist when you look at things and you realize that the world that you envision, the world that you remember, the world that you look at right now, if you're looking outside your window and you look around everything, that all that could be gone. And over the decades to over the tens of decades to over the centuries, an entirely different world would arise. And for a person who is not familiar with the old world, they're just relics, they're just icons, they're just structures of no significance. It's only in that memory for people that remember, they start to see how vast the destruction was and how far the damage had gone and how long the decay had been going on. Now, with the show, again, my hopes in it, based upon the trailer that I've watched, they will touch on various aspects, it seems, through these eight episodes, I believe it is, that connect within the game. Now, nothing is sequential, I should say. And I'll just give you a brief understanding. Fallout 1, Fallout 2, Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 4, and Fallout 76 are the prime games. Now, with that being said, each game, you are a different character at a different point in time after the apocalypse. You are 
picking up in some cases near the time period of a previous game, but you are not the same person throughout all the iterations and nothing specifically follows year by year by year. They're in fact separated in many cases by tens to dozens of years, almost a hundred in one of the two games between one character's appearance and another character's appearance. So the span of time going by is quite significant and the areas that you're in are also different each time. When you're playing the game, that is one of the primary things that you're looking at. You're looking to improve your position, your station, your situation. So you scrounge and you scavenge for things. You look for medicines. You look for equipment. You look for tools to repair things. You look for weapons to protect yourself. You look to make shelter or find shelter. You avoid as many clearly hostile people as you can find because you run across people and in some cases they seem to be docile. They seem to have a moderate temperament. But if you get too close to their stash or if it looks like you're going to move in on their territory they become hostile and then there are different groups and different factions that are more organized and they are around in the wasteland and they exist and they look to control areas one of those groups is known as the brotherhood of steel their primary focus and agenda they were former military from after the war and the realization back then was it's best to keep the technology the weapons and the advanced information controlled because if it gets out to the wrong hands you may end up having another war so they seek to control advanced technology, anything that is left still functioning, any type of equipment, machinery, or even an idea or a person that could effectively get things up and running again, they have to have control of it. You might have another group, which I don't know if it'll be in there. They were called the Institute, and they were located in Boston. And yes, you can make the inference to the MIT Institute that is in Boston, but they were scientists, they were researchers, and they made great advancements with technology basically building upon the basis of androids and synthetic and artificial life. You have different factions out there of gangs and marauders and other people just trying to band together to survive. All of those factions have different levels of interaction with each other, but you as the player are the primary focal point within that. Your actions dictate what happens in that wasteland. Do a favor for this group. Oh, they need somebody to escort this uh, family down to another town, and when you get there, they'll give you the supplies that you need. Somewhere along the way, maybe you come across a couple of bandits, and you handle the business, and those bandits are no more. But what you didn't realize is those couple of bandits came from a larger group that now are following the trail that you left down to that little village that you just dropped that family off, and then you find out later on that they got wiped out. And you go, yes, that's kind of dark, but you know that's the way it is. And as we speak right now in our real world, you have exactly that. You have situations to which people are interacting, trying with one extent or another to do the right thing, but not completely aware of the consequences that could come from those actions. There are places around this world today that are in extreme turmoil an extreme conflict and you have people just doing what they need to survive and we can view it safely from the outside to say well that's wrong and that's wrong and that's okay and they could do better but that's because our toes aren't in that water and we don't have to worry about it because we're safe right here right now and we keep our fingers crossed and hope that it doesn't become us the next morning back into the game however you make these decisions, you have to deal with the consequences, even things that, just like in real life, the parallels are close, but they're not too, too close. You can come across some, shall we say, chemical stimulants that give you a little extra energy, a little hua, and get you going. Fine and Jim Dandy, maybe you need that little boost to get a little hand-to-hand -hand combat against a couple of people, but you get addicted to it. And then you start seeking it out. You start needing it because your character starts to become debilitated and not functioning properly without it. And you start to suffer the effects of withdrawal when you go without it for quite a while. You have to take into account there is a myriad of things out there that are nasty and you can get an infection. And that infection will have some major effects on you as you play along if left untreated, which leads you to have to find the treatment for it. And you may run into a situation where, oh, we've got the, we've got the antigen dope, but we just need the, the compounds, the components to put it together. And then, of course, you get to that situation where now you're out running errands for someone to get this done for them and this done for this other person. Also, this way you can get yourself cured from something that you hope won't kill you before the, before the sun goes down. 
All those small things in the game build into the world of survivalism. It builds into the world of emergency preparedness because you also have to start thinking on a more practical level. When you're playing the game, you're just not wandering around. You can walk all day long and come across absolutely no one, or you can stumble around every single corner and you're smacking you know, toe-to-toe with every single creature and living being out there. But you also have to start thinking about where do you keep your supplies? You can only carry so much literally on you, just like in real life. So now you've got to stash it. And sometimes you say, well, I'll keep it in this old refrigerator in this burned down house. Great. You come back later on and your stuff's gone. Why? Because people are thieves and someone came across it and stole it. And now you're missing all of that gear that you had stored up, hoping to be able to use it later on. Coming up with how do you rest? You can take a quick rest and have no problems, but you may wake up to find someone in that shelter looking you in the eye as they raise a crowbar over your head and get ready to split your skull open. And again, I know I said it is pure entertainment and you may be thinking that my form of entertainment is a bit too morbid and a bit too dark, but the game is what it is and I like what I like. Now, in playing the game, and it is hours of gameplay, I am not a, not an, a fan of the super fast Twitch games that are out there. I remember the Call of Duty back when there were just three of them and they were fun, but I'm at a point now where I like to relax when I play. I like to take my time. I like to enjoy the moment and if need be, take a damn nap and then come back to it later. And that's one of the things I love about Fallout is I'm not missing out on anything by hitting pause because I'm not in the middle of a fast paced event. I can take my time, logically think out what would I do in that situation and what can I do to get me out of there. I can do my research. I can look at my maps. I can do my inventory. I can do all the things that quite honestly I would do in real life if I were in that situation. And that's one of the appeals that I feel it has for preppers is, yes, when people think about prepping and emergency preparedness and post-apocalyptic scenarios, we do think about what you see on the news. We do think about the mass riots and the looting. We do think about the gangs that will be coming up and running the streets. We do think about people fleeing for their lives, literally grabbing the children off the streets and trying to run as fast as they can to get away from whatever's chasing them. But all of that breakneck pace speed does come to a halt and it does slow down. And there are greater periods where there is nothing going on. There are greater periods where it is just quiet. It is just you and whoever is left. And it's that point in time where you have to start thinking, if you haven't already, of a plan to change your situation, of to get out of the mess that you're in, to make things a little bit better where you're at or to find someplace that's better than where you're at right now. In those type of moments, that's where being a prepper really helps because you hopefully have been planning, even to the extreme of the most wild and bizarre ideas, putting that in your head and letting it roll around in there. And at some point you whittle down the fluff and you whittle down the flash and you get the core elements of what is actually plausible, what you can actually do with the resources on hand and with your skill sets that you have to help yourself get through the next day walk that extra mile, figure out how to help these people or figure out how to not to get attacked by someone else. In playing Fallout, you venture out into that world. You come across those scenarios. And again, many of your actions, whether you are playing it straightforward, upfront and honest, or you're doing some backhanded double dealing, eventually everything comes back around to you. You can get yourself bit in the butt real quick by thinking that you're smarter than someone who's apparently in the game been out there and surviving longer than you have. You may think that, oh, you can get away with taking a couple pot shots at these guys and figure you'll run down the hill and you'll be fine, not realizing that they are committed to finding you and chasing you down and you can't shake them off your tail. And of course, you do come across creatures in the wild that just like wild creatures here, look at you as either prey or at the minimum, a challenge to their authority. And nine times out of 10, most times wild creatures will win out because they do not have the same fear, the same rationale that a human being does. They don't look at a human being and think, oh, he's got opposable thumbs. I better be careful. They look at you and think, doesn't have fur to protect the skin, doesn't have talons to rip through mine, doesn't really have a set of teeth that can bite down and get a hold of my jugular. They're thinking you're done for. That's what they're thinking, if at all, other than pure instinct. 
when you play the game and you go through all of the different quests and all the different missions and you start uncovering little tidbits and little secrets, it unfolds a world that is dynamic because it is more human. You come across notes and letters long since written and long ago left unread in some cases by the people they were left for. You discover small little innocuous things that don't really help in the mission. It's just something that's in there. You might come across a note from a parent telling their child that they're going to go down to their grandmother's house because they want to make sure that she's all set and she has the supplies that she needs and they'll be back and dinner's in the fridge. And of course, the day that those bombs dropped, you don't know if the kid made it home to even read the note. You don't know if the parent made it over to their parents to help them out. You have no idea what happened. You just know that that was a note left by someone to say, hey, I'll be back. No need to worry. Have yourself some dinner. Everything will be fine. And then that was the end of that. You can come across different uh, little uh, trinkets here and there that in terms of what they are clearly came from something from a time period before the war that had some value to someone and became just a piece of wasted useless junk because it retained nothing of any value. You think about right now our cell phones. For many people, your cell phone, you will save your cell phone before you save a person falling onto a train track. But if there's a war and you've got no, you, no use for the electronics, they become nothing. They don't even become decoration. They're just litter laying about. So you feel to one certain extent that people very soon that survived realize that all the things that they held as important, as valuable, suddenly had no value whatsoever. Because realistically, if it doesn't nourish you, if it doesn't heal you, and if it doesn't protect you in those situations, it has no real value. It has nothing of use to you. Yeah, you could say you could find someone who wants something, and there's always going to be people that want something. But on the realistic aspect of it, if you think about those three things, whatever you have, your possessions, you walk around your apartment, your house, whatever it is, and you think, if it does not nourish you, if it doesn't provide you with some type of benefit health-wise, if it doesn't heal you, if it doesn't protect you, and that doesn't always mean firearms, that literally can mean the appropriate clothing for the appropriate weather conditions. If it doesn't do something like that, one of those three, then you really don't actually need it. And in terms of prepping an emergency preparedness, that's something that you have to take in consideration. You know, gadgets are fantastic. I love gadgets. I absolutely do. But I also understand that many of the gadgets need support. They need constant maintenance and upkeep. They need an entire system dedicated to keeping them charged up, running properly, and everything else. And in some cases, yes, you can do that yourself, but then that means you also need to have that equipment, those spare cans of oil. You need to have those extra batteries, those cables, and all those other tools just to maintain that one or two uh, special gadgets that you have. You have to be able to having the skill that if you don't have the spare parts, you can go out and you can acquire them and you can make do, you can make shift. If you think about uh, the TV shows back in the 80s, MacGyver and A-Team specifically, I remember watching those as a kid and I absolutely loved them for the creativity of you, you lock the A-Team in a hardware store and you say you've got them surrounded. No, think again. You, you lock the A-Team in a hardware store. They are not surrounded. They are just waiting for you to realize that you messed up. You give MacGyver a box full of junk. And he will spend 15 minutes crafting whatever he needs to craft to get him out of that situation. Even though, yes, those were based upon fictional situations with a lot of Hollywood flash and drama put into it to make it seem more plausible. And yes, it was more for the pure entertainment of the young minds such as myself. It is not to say that being creative, thinking outside of the box, understanding how you can make certain things work for you, even if they weren't originally intended for that purpose, that also too is a key thing with being a prepper. A key thing with emergency preparedness is understanding that at some point everything breaks down, you run out of your last backup, you're in a situation where you, as far as you can tell, have nothing left until you get that one spark of ingenuity, that one little light bulb that comes back on and you go, I've got it. And you start piecing everything together to fix the situation that you're in, to, to patch that pump hose, to get the generator running, to figure a way to move those objects that are far too heavy for you to do on your own, but you have to get it done. You come up with those ideas and sure, stress, pressure, 
A lot of people do well under that. I myself have no problems. If I am under actual pressure, I do better because my brain shuts off all the non-essential stuff and I just become simply get that task done. If I don't have time to be distracted by other thoughts, I am laser focused on what it is I need to do. And as soon as that pressure is off and I can relax, well then, you know, let the squirrels run loose and I have every single thought in the world bouncing around inside my head. So in watching the trailers and seeing how, you know, they go, and I will say this, trailers often are more exciting than the movie or the TV show because they take the best part of any scene, combine that with the right timing of the cuts and of the music to give you just enough of a tease where you see something, but you don't know enough about it to have a definitive, yes, I know exactly what this is before it moves to the next scene. So in many cases, I have watched trailers for different TV shows and different movies and then watched the actual production of it. And it's been, eh, I'm still holding out for this. So I, I will say this, I'm holding out that this will be as good as I hope it will, that it will meet and maybe exceed my expectations. In terms of playing the game, again, I don't expect it to be the game because it's not one singular character, one singular event that it's based upon. So the leeway, the freedom that the director has in moving that story of the TV show along is not going to disrupt my chain of thought. It's, it's absolutely fine because it would be no different than, in fact, I can honestly say I had two friends. We were at one point, we were both or all three of us playing the game and we would be in some of the same exact areas about the same time period. And, you know, it was each solo play, but we would have completely different encounters and different events going on in those same areas. And we would travel to different parts within the world to basically see what would happen. Oh, you did this? Well, let me try this. And we, mo we would get different results. Sometimes we would have some of the same act activities and actions going on. Other times it would be completely different because our time, our location, our our attitude in terms of interaction with the other player player characters in there, the uh, NPCs rather, all make those differences, those slight differences. And even our playing styles, one of my buddies, he is pick everything up that you see. If And again, I'll throw a flashback to uh, Steve Martin in The Jerk uh, when he was leaving his home. You know, he didn't need anything except for this chair and, and this lamp, and I just need this cup, and I, I just need this book over here. And he started picking everything up that he could along the way. That's his playing style. He will take everything that he sees because he knows eventually he's going to need something, doesn't know what, doesn't know how much of it, I had another buddy, he would just play, and if he saw something, he'd remember where it was, and he'd try to come back to it later, and, you know, no surprise, he would forget where it was, and he would have to go someplace else. I work on the basis of, I take what I think I need, and I use it as quickly as I can, and then I go get something else. If I've made something that I don't need right away, I will hide it. If I have something that works really well, and I've got the other item almost like it, but it's not as good, I'm trashing the not as good, and I'll use it for parts later on. So each of our personalities kind of molded the way we played and how we went along with things, and that does have a, an effect in the game. As in, in real life, if you are a person that does in fact collect that pack rats that says, oh, I could use this for something, but you never get around to it, at a certain point, you're going to have a lot of things that you haven't used. You have them and you had the intention. And I've been guilty of that myself. Every now and then when I'm doing a clean out of the workshop or someplace else, I'll see things and go, oh, I remember what I was going to use this for, but that particular reason has long been gone. Or I'll find something and I think to myself, well, I know I picked this up. I know I was going to use it for something, but I can't remember what it is. And I may hang on to it or I may decide, well, I can't remember and currently it doesn't seem to be working or I have an immediate use for it. So I'm going to give it the heave ho. And in prepping, it's the same thing. You can stack up and stock up on a bunch of things, but if you're not able to use them or you don't have an idea of what you're going to use them for, or even if you do say, well, I've got this 500 piece toolkit so that way I can repair stuff. But if your repair skills 
to date have not allowed you to simply fix and tune up your lawnmower, then getting a 500 piece tool kit really isn't going to make a difference because yes, tools are a definite help and the adage of the right tool for the right job is true. That is absolutely true. But if you don't have the skill or the knowledge or the practice in using them, it really does no good. You'd be better off whatever money you spent instead of getting a 500 piece toolkit, get yourself a 20 piece toolkit, something simple, easy, screwdrivers, wrenches, hammer, a small saw, nothing too spectacular and handle the minor stuff around the house. If you know that you have equipment that you want to be able to use, I've got a generator. I know that I want to be able to use the generator. So I've made sure that I have oil, that I've got the spark plugs and that I also know how to do clean outs of the carburetor and disassemble that and keep everything functioning. So this way in the event that the power goes out, whether it's going to be for a day, whether it's going to be for a longer period of time, I know that the generator will work. I've personally even speaking on that generator, it's a dual fuel so I can use gasoline or propane. So even in a scenario where it's a total system wide grid collapse, everything is shut down, the economy is faltered, and it's just absolute chaos and pandemonium. I know where I can get propane cylinders. I know where I can acquire propane cylinders. And acquiring those is far easier than trying to siphon out gas from a gas station when there's no power. And I know this simply because I asked a petroleum fuel transfer specialist as he was filling up a uh, underground tank at a gas station about how that would work. And he showed me down the actual fill hole, which when you're at a gas station and you see those mini manhole covers, one of those covers is the direct fill hole. Another one is a vent hole and another one's for some type of pressure test. But the fill hole, that goes straight down 15 feet before it gets to the top of the tank that's in there, depending upon the size. It might be a 5,000 gallon or a 10,000 gallon, depending upon what the station put in. But think about that, 15 feet before it gets to the top, and that's if the tank is full. Now, if you're thinking you'll just drop a garden hose down there and siphon it out that way, you don't have the lung capacity to maintain that pressure. So you would need some type of pump, some type of hand pump to generate that air pressure and reverse basically negative air pressure to pull up all of that fuel. And that's something that people don't think about. And then also you add to the fact that you've got the cap off and you've got this open uh, vent coming up. If there has been gas and vapors building up, you might not immediately notice it. And yeah, if you get a spark going, you won't have a chance to say goodbye. You will be gone and so will everyone else within a 750 foot radius. It'll just be, you know, marshmallows melted, crispy down on the ground. That is it. It is sticky and gooey and you're done. So you think about those things and you think, oh, that would be something that you would not like to have happen to you after you've managed to survive the initial onslaught and downfall in a post-apocalypse situation because people make mistakes and it's usually those mistakes that end up biting them in the butt and swinging right back around into the game. That game is full of that where you make that wrong decision and it comes back to bite you in the butt very hard. In some cases, it's not metaphorical, it's literal within the game. Thinking about the TV show, thinking about the connections that I feel preppers can learn and even non-preppers, and quite honestly, I think that would be a perfect learning experience. If you are a person that is not a prepper, doesn't like the idea of being called a prepper, doesn't consider emergency preparedness a thing, but yet you've managed to acknowledge to yourself that with the number of floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, all natural disasters that have been growing in intensity, where you had two thirds of the state of Texas without power during a winter storm. And I say that again, two thirds of the state of Texas was without power during a winter storm. That's something that did not ever happen at all in the decades before. You have to start thinking, well, things can go wrong that are out of your control, absolutely. But making no plans on what to do when that happens, that is 100% on you. So if you think to yourself, well, maybe I should consider doing a little bit more to benefit myself if that happens, watch the show. Pure entertainment, you'll get a good laugh, 
And then you'll start thinking to yourself, well, that's a bit extreme to prepare for. So maybe I should just start with, you know, some first aid kits, some water, some, you know, dried goods, maybe some rations, MRE, something easy like that. Maybe I should get some spare clothing from the uh, Goodwill store to keep on hand to change into or learn how to fix some of the things I have around the house instead of waiting for either the landlord or hiring a contractor to do it. Now, don't bite off more than you can chew. Absolutely not. You know, small bites, baby steps. That's where you have to look at it with prepping is small bites, baby steps. You do that and you will travel a distance. You will learn and you will start to accomplish things. And some things become a lot easier. I mean, I've been a prepper for a good 30 years, but everything has its beginnings and it would be small things that I started with and I started building up and building up and it wasn't until much much later where I started to be able to get a system going and yeah there are pitfalls there are downfalls and there are setbacks with everything and there have been times where my bright idea you know that I had in the beginning later on was not such a bright idea and I either wasted time or I wasted money but I learned from that and I learned how to adjust and adapt and not make that same mistake. That's what prepping is about. It's never going to be a perfect system. Don't ever believe anyone that says, you know, you can do exactly this and everything will work out because it won't. You can have a good idea, which is good, and you can have a decent idea, which is all right, and you can have a I'm not so sure about it idea, which is still perfectly fine, but I'd rather have any one of those three than no idea at all. I'd rather have a bad plan, as strange as it may sound, than no plan at all, because at least with a bad plan, you have something to look at. You have something to gauge. You can say, okay, this is my plan. It doesn't sound good, and it's really not good, but in comparison to and then you think, okay, well, how can I make it better? You have something to work off of. Instead of absolute silence in your head, you've got ideas that are moving around. You can pick and choose and you can think to yourself, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to accomplish. This is what I would prefer not happening should I take this action. And playing the game, watching the show, I feel that there should be that envelope that opens up of development, that idea, that horizon where you can look out and you can see, okay, I get the point of the show, I get the characters, I'm immersed in the world, and now I'm seeing it from that perspective of not simply being a person watching it on a screen, but now thinking if I were in that position, if I were in a similar position, it doesn't even have to be, you know, after a nuclear apocalypse in some wasteland area. It could just simply be after a major earthquake. It could be after a blizzard. It could be after an airplane, you know, crashes down into a neighborhood. Any type of situation where you now have to struggle to survive, you have to make a plan on how not to die and that's what you look at. You can take those extreme examples, you can pare them down, you can dilute them into more manageable concepts and more simplistic ideas, but it still comes down to just that. Being prepared, having the right equipment, having the knowledge to use that equipment, but also having the creative understanding of how to make things work even when you really don't have what you need to get everything done the exact way that you would like. Because with real life, nothing is going to be picture perfect at all. You are going to have flaws in everything. And many of the preps and many of the items that I have, some are new, some are, you know, right off the showroom floor type of stuff, ready to go. Others I've reconditioned and repurposed from different things that I've had or I found on the side of the road. I make do with what I have because on my aspect of it also, sinking tens of thousands of dollars into something like that is nothing that I can do. I don't have that at all. So I work with free is good for me. I start from there. When there is something that I absolutely know that I will need and that I will need to use, but it's not something that I can manufacture, it's not something that I can, you know, slap together, that's when I decide, well, what am I willing to spend on it? How much am I willing to do? And, you know, I look at it from that perspective, do what I can first on my own and then go and try to buy and acquire what I need after that. And with emergency preparedness, a lot of cases, that's what you end up doing. Now, you can, you can bargain hunt, you can shop around, you can two for one, and you can build up your supplies, your, your stockpiles without a problem, and you will find at a certain point that you've got a certain rhythm going. You know what you're doing, you've got a better plan, a better hold on you know, your, your whole situation. 
And you look at that and now you start thinking, well, how are you putting all of this into a use? Because eventually you're going to have tubs and boxes and barrels full of stuff, but you have to have an idea of what all that stuff is going to be used for. And then you start thinking about breaking it down into different kits. So you, now you're thinking, well, I'll have this trauma kit to hold all of these medical uh, devices and pieces of equipment and medicines, and this will be what I use if I have to travel. And then I'll make this kit over here will be the one for somewhat serious injuries, but still nothing too bad. And then I'll have these smaller ones to keep in the glove box or to keep in a uh, backpack, you know, to help out with the boo-boos and the uchis and the ouchies, that sort of thing. You start dividing up where you decide to store things and what you're going to use. I have tools that I use for all of my major work and they stay in my workshop because I don't bring them out and about. But I keep a pair of basically throwaway disposable tools in my vehicle because I've had my vehicle broken into once or twice and the first time they took a good set of tools. The second time they took one or two good tools so I don't do that anymore. And I had a vehicle when they broke into it another time, separate vehicle each time. They went through the toolbox, but I had all my junky tools. I had the things that had no real value, that they're not going to be able to pawn them off and get anything from it. They're not worth anything. They can't just simply go back to a store and say, oh, yeah, this uh, wrench doesn't work, so I want my money back. So there was no value for them, so they left them. But the tools work well enough that if I have a simple breakdown on the side of the road with one of the things that usually goes wrong in a car, I can still fix it. So I'm not without the capability of fixing it to either get home or get it to an auto repair shop and have them use their real tools and take care of the problem. But I learned to parcel out and manage and compartmentalize the different things that I have and the different things that I use for that situation. Now, granted, Sometimes things get a little chaotic. Sometimes things get a little disorganized because I'll start working on projects and I'll have to move things around. So I'll put this over here with that and that over there with those things. And at a certain point, a few weeks has gone by and I can't remember where I put certain things or I can't get to it because I'm still doing whatever work that I was doing. And, you know, that's a me thing. That's not an item thing, but that's something that I work on on my own to try to rectify the situation. But I still know that having the items, having the gear, having the tools, the equipment, all that stuff is great. It's, it's something that you can take a load off your mind and ease up a little bit, but you still need to know what you're going to do with it, how you're going to work with it. What do you do if that backup no longer is a backup and it becomes your primary? And then what happens if that primary now is defunct? You know, is it something that you can walk away from or is it part of your critical needs that you say, nope, I absolutely need to have this and I need to have it functioning. So now I've got to go out and get a new one or I've got to go out and figure out how to get this one repaired. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? These are things that you now start to explore your own veritable wasteland and thinking about where could you go in those dire situations to find the things that you need to get the work done. And that's really the aspect that I keep circling around on. It's the thought process, the creative ideas that you have as an individual that you put those plans into motion, run them through your head. You think about it as a, a dry run inside your mind about what you would do. And visually speaking, when I play the game, that to one extent or another is exactly what goes on. Yes, I'm playing the game and I know it's a game and I'm enjoying it as it is. But in my mind, I still think about what I would do in my real world if this, then that, or if this and that should occur. And then, yeah, some things it's still, oh, well, I've got no real definitive clue on how I'm going to handle that. Other cases, I may come across one of those eureka moments and I will remember something that goes, oh, yeah, I know where I could go to find this or, oh, I've got an idea of exactly what I need to do if this breaks down and I need to repair this and I need to get this working over here. All of those things play into emergency preparedness, all of those things are connected. And entertainment many times can put basically a litmus test up for you. You can watch certain disaster movies and horror movies and survivor movies, zombie movies. I honestly, I will tell you this ahead of time, I love zombie movies, not for the horror or the gore. It, that's superficial. I like it for simply watching the characters, how they react, how they adapt. In some cases, how they 
fail miserably to that new environment of the actual zombies, whether they're fast-moving zombies or slow shufflers, whether they're the zombies that somehow retain all of their intellect and they know how to operate machinery, cars, and doors, or whether they're the mindless zombies that can be tricked by someone tossing a beer can against the wall on the opposite direction and they all gather around that. Whatever the situation is, I enjoy watching because I like to see how those characters in those situations handle it in comparison to what I think I would do in that situation and how I would handle it. And especially if there are glaring failures, which yes, for the fiction that is the story, some of those wide open plot holes are done simply to move that story along. Other cases, it's the forebodingness of you know that everyone's going to die in this particular film. It's just a matter of how badly and how soon before they all do. That's the way a lot of those things are set up, and that's part of the entertainment value in watching it. You can bet that in one film, everyone's going to die. You can bet in another film, only this person might survive or that person might survive. And you look at the potential reasons why that might happen. And you look at the pitfalls that other people fell into, those characters fell into during the storyline. And you think, what would that be like in your situation? And those are the types of films that, you know, get my mind going. In some cases, it is pure unadulterated fantasy that, you know, if I were left into a mall situation like with uh, George Romero's 2004 Dawn of the Dead, that idea, that concept, I would have done completely different from my end of it compared to the way they did. But that's me, and I'm not in that story. But you look at those things, you keep those things in your mind, in the back burner, and you think about all of the different avenues and exits and alleyways of not just traversing your environment physically, but also traversing those scenarios that could arise in it. And you can even think about it just simply in terms of, you know, you live near the coast and there's been a tsunami warning and this time it's legit and you only have a limited amount of time to get away from the shoreline. But unfortunately, you're behind about 60,000 other cars that are also trying to do the same thing on the two highways and the three state roads that lead away. So now you start thinking to yourself, where can you go to get high enough above ground so this tsunami hopefully won't wipe you out. You start thinking about buildings. You start thinking about hiking trails and you start remembering that, oh, there was an observation point in this one park and you remember that that observation point said it was the highest point in the entire town at, you know, 300 some feet above ground. So now you're thinking, oh, that's only three quarters of a mile away from where I'm at. I can make that, I can cut through these side streets, I can make my way across the parking lot, damn the curbs and damn the potholes, I'm going to get there. So you've thought of a way that you can't escape the area, but you can at least get yourself high enough out of the way that hopefully when that tsunami wave comes in 60 feet high and traveling at 80 miles an hour, you're going to see a lot of destruction, you're going to see a lot of chaos and pandemonium, but you yourself will have made it through because by the time the water gets to you, you'll be on an island, as it were, until that water recedes, but at least you won't be under it or trapped in a building that ends up collapsing because it got slammed by two other buildings, because that also, too, is a situation that happens in those situations. Now, swinging down and around in relation to survivalism as a whole, it is not really that complex. It, it seems that way because, and I see it myself, you watch on YouTube as an example, and you see, you know, doomsday preppers, and you see different survivalists in different types of prepping channels, and the ones that have the big money, the ones that have the bunkers, the ones that have a year's worth of supply of food and water for themselves, for their dogs and everything, those are fantastic. Those, those are prepper goals. Yes, every prepper would love to comfortably be able to say that for the next 365 days, we don't need anybody. We have food, we have water, we have medicines, we have everything that we need that we can stay sheltered away, whether it's underground or just on, you know, 65 acres worth of land. It doesn't matter. But most people, by and large, don't have that option, don't have that opportunity, don't have the bank account or the space to do all that. So they have to make do with what they can. So I enjoy the more realistic aspect of do what you can with what you have, and then you try to make it work out from there. Waiting for April 11th, Amazon video. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope that overall the show does live up to my personal expectations, but I also hope that any of you that are, you know, taking the time with me here, give it a look. 
you know, just check it out, see what it's about. I'm not telling anyone to get the game. Sure, that would be great, but that is a time investment. Even myself right now, my schedule's too busy for me to go back into the wasteland and, and enjoy exploring around because, yes, I've put in literally hundreds of hours on that game. And if you're wondering which one is my favorite one, Currently, it is still Fallout 4 as the number one, then Fallout 3 as the number two, and then Fallout New Vegas as the number three. But that's just me, and I know that for game players out there, we all have our personal favorites that we love more than the others, and we all have the reasons why we love them, but those are mine. But in terms of time, I just don't have the time to sit back and enjoy, you know, hour upon hour upon hour right now. I may decide to pick up the controller and go back at it one more time before the show starts just to kind of get my juices flowing. Or I may just wait until after the series is over because it's my understanding that they're going to release all eight episodes all at once. So technically... On the 11th, if you chose to hunker down, you know, buckle yourself in, you could hit all eight episodes at once. I'm not going to be able to do that because, one, I have work the next day. And also, two, my family and I, we already made the discussion that we'll watch probably the first two episodes, maybe three, depending on what it is. But we all have stuff to do the following day, so it'll end up waiting until the weekend before we get around to watching any more. So with that being said, that is what I have for you today. And well, I hope you do check out the show. It's not a sponsorship. I'm not getting paid by Amazon to say it, not getting paid by Bethesda to talk about the game. I just enjoy it a lot. And I really do feel that the game and possibly the show will have some insights that if you step back from the fantasy, if you step back from the fiction and you really look at it, that it does have something that every person with emergency preparedness in mind could actually learn from. So until then, I'll catch you in the next one.